Welcome to the Australian Water School, the home of demand-driven industry design training for the global water sector. Hello and welcome to today's webinar covering groundwater time series analyses. I'm Cray Price. I'm honored to be your host today, but I'm also attending as an eager learner since this is definitely a topic that is relevant to my own work. Now, it's great to see such widespread attendance and interest from all around the globe. So welcome to everybody in whichever time zone you happen to be joining us from. So let's introduce today's speakers. We'll, we're going to be hearing from Todd Rasmussen of the University of Georgia, Chris Turnage from CSIRO and Gabriel Rao from the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. Now, if you can all turn on your cameras, um, let's get to know you a little better today. Um, let us know, um, first of all, where you're coming to us from, um, maybe what time it is for you. And then I'm also interested, um, you know, groundwater, I, I go out in the field with a lot of people monitoring groundwater bores and wells and things like that. Um, and I'm curious just um, how, how, the, how things, how life has been treating you um, over these last couple of years with COVID and with all the, um, uh, with all the kind of upheaval in the world. Um, have you been able to get out in the field? Um, or have, you, have you been able to uh, enjoy getting back out and getting into the field again? So let's start uh, maybe with Chris. Um, have you been locked down and uh, are you ready to get back out there again? Yeah, thanks, Craig. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm coming to uh, everyone from Adelaide here in Australia and uh, it's about mid-afternoon, so it's getting towards the, uh, the best end of the day. Uh, yeah, it's, it's been, I don't know, two years since I've done field work. I think the last time we went out was Norfolk Island in the South Pacific. But um, yeah, we're hoping to get out soon. We're hoping to get out to the, uh, the Northern Territory here in Australia. Uh, and, uh, some water sampling up there. Excellent. Uh, Gab, have you been out uh, in, uh, in, in the field uh, there over in Germany? Um, yeah, we've, we were locked down for quite a while, so we couldn't do any um, field work. But um, yeah, last year, usually in summer, it's better. Um, so we went to do a teaching trip in Austria. That was pretty nice. Excellent. And Todd, um, I understand you have uh, you get out there quite a bit uh, with your students, do you? Well, we go out once a month. We couldn't uh, just stand staying indoor, but we socially distance in a safe location. Let me show you where we go. These are some <laughs> caves in Alabama. Well, just backing up, my current time zone is one in the morning here. So my students are just getting home for their evening studies and beverage consumption. And so <laughs> this is the size of the caves where we're studying the hydrology of the mountain above us. And it'd be like monitoring a watershed from below. Oh, awesome. Now, that's great. Um, now, as you as you get ready to start sharing your screen, um, we're looking forward to hearing from you first. But let's have a look at the poll results first. And um, let us know if there's anything that uh, that surprises you um, from this uh, from this poll. So I see on here if uh, we can scroll down and and have a look at where the attendees are coming to us from and what their background is. And I guess um, let's just open it back up again to Chris and then Gab and Todd, you know, have a look at that and let us know is there anything that surprises you there about the attendees um, are they more experienced or less experienced than you would have expected yeah i'd say uh obviously excel is the workhorse the, the go yes. workhorse for a lot of analysis um no surprise there <laughs> but uh yeah yeah it's, it's good to see you know some experience in uh, in this area uh, irrespective of the, the tool that's being used yeah good gab or todd any surprises there there is no surprise in the hydrogeology attendance, I, su I suppose. Um, I'm a little bit surprised about um, the background. So um, quite a lot of um, government policy um, and academic. I didn't expect that. Yeah. And there's a good range of experiences. Groundwater monitoring is strong. Aquifer hydraulics um, is good. Regression is strong. So those are all good skill sets. Yeah, good. And I see, uh, you know, even even things uh, that technically perhaps obscure concepts, uh, fast Fourier transforms, 13% uh, have uh, answered that one in the positive. And so, yeah, we've got, um, you know, several hundred attendees uh, here. So this gives us a good sample. So with that, let's turn the time over to Todd. So I'm going to start out. Actually, this is not my first slide. So let me get back up. Um, we're putting together a book on surface water interactions with groundwater, looking at the dynamic behavior in the critical zone, which is the upper uh, surface of the earth from the top of the canopy down to the uh, 
hard rock. So it's essentially the um, critical part of the planetary hydrogeologic systems. Um, this is just some of the data we're developing. This is a well that just shows a lot of interesting behavior. At the top in the blue line is a 12 year um, um, duration of data. And you'll notice that there are gaps and there's a lot of variation in water levels. A lot of uh, textbooks think of groundwater as a static system with stable groundwater levels. What we're finding is there are many hydrodynamic components of groundwater. Uh, if we zero in on this small period in 2015 here, you'll see this unusual twice daily behavior here with uh, weekly um, behavior with unusual um, peaks in the middle of it, which are very difficult to explain. Um, what I argue is that these are responses to some kind of external input that the groundwater level is um, picking up that signal. And it's like a radio with a receiver, but we don't know what's being transmitted. And the second period here in 2018 corresponds to a summer period, which also has very different um, and unusual behavior. Uh, what we'd like to argue is we can use these for explaining different processes within the groundwater system. Here's a great figure from uh, Jonathan Kennel. Um, and he looked at a long-term water levels. In this case, it was over a year of one second data. And in light gray here is the rainfall. And you can see in the winter here that the precipitation period caused groundwater levels to rise substantially. There are other effects though. You see these harmonic earth tide effects due to solar and lunar uh, disturbance of the solid earth that affect groundwater. Uh, you also see these uh, slow recession due to drainage during the summer months. Barometric pressure is also a signal that we receive in our wells. It's inverse as the pressure goes up, the water level goes down. That's because like blowing into a straw, when you blow down into a straw, the water surface goes down. You also see seismic uh, responses. A coast seismic is from a source distance. In this case, this is in California and the earthquake was in Peru. And we see a distinct response uh, to that seismic event. You also see a more a response, a different response to uh, a closer event, Ridgecrest, that caused water levels to decline due to alteration of the geomechanical structure of the uh, formation. Um, so what we see are these uh, external influences due to mass flow, which is recharge and pumping. You also get an effect due to mass loading. When you load the ground surface with weight, um, it tends to change the behavior of the water. Here's an example from Franklin King in 1892, where he was monitoring groundwater levels and he showed every time a train went across the, near the well, he would see the water levels rise. This uh, graph he plotted upside down, 28 is uh, um, inverted on this graph. So every time a train went by, and Jacob also showed that uh, when a locomotive stops at the train station and causes the water levels to rise, it slowly declined once the train stops and it returns to normal, but as the train departs then it falls again and then recovers once the train leaves. But these kinds of mass loadings uh, along with mass flow, as well as the responses to earth tides can be used to estimate aquifer properties. It's as though you get, uh, by monitoring water levels, you can estimate a number of, of aquifer properties, such as recharge, discharge, reservoir volumes, and safe yields, simply by monitoring these responses to natural stimulations. 
And as we'll go over in the course, uh, there's two types of approaches. One is in the time domain where you use regression deconvolution. The other is where you use uh, frequency domain tools like Fourier transport and harmonic analysis. Um, here's uh, the response to barometric pressure. You often see uh, when the barometric pressure goes up, the water level goes down. Again, these scales are reversed here. Um, so there's a negative relationship. And we also get solar and lunar tidal effects in wells. The red line here is the uh, theoretical earth tide, but this is the actual observed earth tide. And so the response to the periodic signals uh, provides additional characterization information that can be used to understand your system. The other one is barometric pressure changes on unconfined aquifers. What happens there is there's a rapid increase in barometric pressure in the well itself, but there's a time lag that as the air diffuses through the unsaturated zone, and so the aquifer takes uh, time to respond to that change in barometric pressure. And the result is that the water level initially drops in an unconfined well, and then slowly recovers to the original condition due to the diffusion of this hydrodynamic wave to the subsurface. We actually have an AGU monograph out on this uh, uh, time periodic groundwater components, uh, looking at how diffusion waves move to porous media. But before you can even begin to try and understand the responses to these signals, there are these data anomalies that need to be uh, reconciled before you can move forward. So there are things like steps where your uh, water level data all of a sudden steps up. This is usually due to someone visiting the well, removing the sensor and replacing it at a different level than it was originally. We also get these unusual spikes in the level. Again, maybe somebody has disturbed the sensor. Frequently, we get these gaps as well as trends. And so we have to remove these anomalies. There's also some issues related to the type of barometric pressure. I often get uh, emails from people sharing data and they said they have measure, pressure measurement, but it's often uncertain which type of pressure measurement that they're using. Um, so I'll go over that next, as well as water density, temperature and salinity causes uh, yeah, especially in deep wells with warm or saline water, we often have problems with trying to understand um, what the water levels are. And this can affect the gradient uh, of the direction and magnitude of groundwater flow. For example, here's a polar diagram where zero means the gradient is to the north, uh, 90 means the gradient is to the east. What this indicates is that the gradient is to the west, northwest, the distance from the center is the steepness or the magnitude of the gradient. And you'll notice that over time without compensation, uh, it appears that the groundwater is drifting to this uh, east, southeast. So uh, trying to adjust water levels for both um, the type of pressure measurement and the density of the fluid is critical. So uh, to summarize, there are four kinds of pressure transducers. Most people just um, buy a pressure sensor without really understanding uh, the type. What we try to use in all our calculations is the absolute pressure, the total head. And the total head is relative to a vacuum. Uh, so the absolute could be above or below barometric pressure in which case um, we use a gauge pressure to measure relative to barometric, and we use a vacuum gauge. Sorry, my uh, arrows are touchy. Um, the vacuum gauge is, uh, is negative relative to barometric, and the differential is between two different um, uh, absolute pressures. So once we have that barometric pressure converted to an absolute, we have to um, uh, consider a freshwater head. In many wells, we may have warm or saline water. 
And if we have a pressure transducer below the water surface, we have to compensate for the effects of the density of the fluid. You can think of the well as a manometer. Normally, we think of a manometer as either a mercury manometer or a freshwater manometer. Certainly, the density of the fluid in the monitor affects the water level or the surface of the fluid. And so to adjust between pressure and your freshwater head, you have to compensate for this, um, the density of the water level. Now, this was made apparent during an aquifer test at the Hanford nuclear site in central Washington state, where they had a deep well with hot water at the bottom. And the cool water was on top of it due to a geothermal gradient. When they started pumping the well, the well water level was about 10 meters below the ground when they began. But after they started pumping, the water level began to rise. And as the water level rose, the, um, the pumping rate remained constant. Normally, when you pump a well, the water level drops. But in this case, the water level was rising. As the water level rose, they became worried as it approached the surface of the casing. So they increased the pumping rate to try and stop the water level from rising any further. But the water started to vent or uh, flow out of the well. It became artesian when they started pumping the the water uh, out of the well. And the reason was is because they replaced a column of cold water with this hot water. And the hot water is less dense than the cool water. So it required a total absolute, um, total uh, uh, elevation in order to maintain the pressure at the base. So essentially the water level here is, is uh, a function of the fluid density you change the fluid density in your well and you change the water surface elevation. Um, this also affects, uh, say, um, situations near the coast. We had an island off the coast of Georgia where the observed water levels in the well were um, above sea level. But the concern was that they thought there was saltwater contamination of this freshwater aquifer at a certain depth below the surface. It turns out when you compare the density of freshwater to the density of ocean water, ocean water is about 3.5% heavier than freshwater. So when you adjusted the sea level elevation to an equivalent freshwater head, then the elevation in the ocean was actually higher than the water level in, uh, in the well on the island, which confirmed that there was saltwater intrusion. So simply using water levels and wells without considering the effects of the fluid density and the type of pressure measurement can lead to incorrect estimates of your hydraulic gradient. Excellent, well, thank you, Todd. So with that, we're looking forward to hearing from Chris. Over to you. Great, thanks, Craig. Uh, yeah, so in this second section of the uh, presentation, I'll just be talking about some of the um, more so-called traditional methods of interpreting uh, groundwater uh, responses to both uh, earth tide influences and to atmospheric uh, influences, so changes in barometric pressure. And from these, uh, deriving both conceptual and uh, quantitative insights, uh, and so to start with, uh, one question uh, a hydrogeologist might ask themselves is whether uh, earth tide influence is present in a, in a given time series. So a time series of groundwater pressure um, as shown in the, the blue series here. So maybe 12 months worth of uh, measurement data uh, measured at a, 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 an hourly interval, for example. And so uh, when we're talking about earth tides here, we're sort of talking uh, we're talking about changes in uh, gravitational acceleration at the Earth's surface. And so these, um, so we, we tend to think of uh, G or gravitational acceleration as uh, 9.8 meters per second squared. And we think of it as being a constant, but we, we know it varies with altitude, for example, but it also varies uh, in time uh, and, uh, you know, in the order of less than 1%, but um, these variations in time are both measurable um, and predictable. 
And so, and in, in the order of say nanometers to micrometers. And so if we think of the, um, the subsurface as a sponge, for example, and so the, uh, the, and this is trying to get away from, you know, thinking of the subsurface as being rigid. If we think of the subsurface as a sponge and we think of uh, the earth tide, the effect of the earth tide on, on gravity as a pulling and a pushing, um, as shown in the schematic diagram here, the, the, these forces are occurring at land surface. Uh, and so if you imagine that the, the total load on a, on a saturated zone, so on, on the water table, for example, so the total load of the atmosphere and uh, the unsaturated zone, if you imagine that not changing in time just for a moment, but if you imagine that the skeleton of the subsurface is being contracted and expanded by these earth tides, then you can imagine that, uh, that the, the pore pressures in the, in the saturated zone, those pressures are going to change because of the expansion and contraction of the skeleton. In this case, it's not because of a variation in the load over time, it's, it's more the, the skeleton. So, I mean, it, it, the responses to this, do we see a response to earth tide variations and, and, and these kind of um, processes? So in a confined aquifer, so in the saturated zone, yes, we do see a pressure change. Uh, in, a bore, in, a, in an open borehole that we don't see a change because the borehole is, is rigid and doesn't contract and expand in the same way as the subsurface. And similarly in, in uh, the unsaturated zone, so an unconfined aquifer, we don't see the, uh, the the uh, effects of earth tides. And so we can use this information to our advantage. And so one of the, well, the traditional um, method for uh, assessing whether earth tides are present in a groundwater pressure time series is Fourier analysis. And so this is where we, we take our time series and we decompose it into a sum of sinusoidal uh, functions and so if, if the sum of these functions can, uh, can, they can be summed to recover the original signal, but essentially we're going from pressure versus time to uh, a number of frequencies uh, equally spaced that all have uh, a unique amplitude. And for earth tide analysis, we really uh, focus on a particular uh, frequency band. So generally speaking between one and two cycles a day, they're the frequencies we're most interested in. And so that's what's shown in the second plot here. And uh, for, for the examples of uh, demonstration, uh, two, I'm showing, I'm highlighting two of those particular frequencies of interest. So one being the, the M2 frequency, which is about 1.9 cycles per day, that's the red dot, and the S2 uh, frequency, which is about two cycles a day, and that's the yellow uh, circle there. And so uh, we can make interpretations. Um, in this case, uh, just based on the relative um, comparisons of the amplitudes of, say, these two particular frequencies. Um, in, in terms of applying this in, in Python, for example, in regular Python, there are um, uh, two commands in the, the NumPy library, uh, which can be used to uh, calculate the frequencies and the amplitudes separately from a given input time series. And similarly, with our hydrogeoscience package that we've developed for Python, uh, we've got equivalent, uh, an equivalent two lines of code there. And so uh, once both of those are calculated, they can be fed into map, a package like matplotlib to plot them up in the amplitude spectrum that you can see here. So um, in terms of interpreting these results, uh, so and, and particularly the comparing those two frequencies I mentioned, the M2 and the S2, generally speaking, when the, M, the amplitude of the M2 component is larger than that of the S2, then we're looking at confined conditions. So this is a, a pretty rough and ready uh, means of assessing uh, confinement uh, from the re uh, response in groundwater to earth tides. I just wanna show the, the counter example as well here. So this is um, a different time series from the same um, location in the interior of Western Australia and a similar, maybe shorter duration of measurement. But um, this, uh, the amplitude spectrum here is um, the opposite, essentially. So uh, the, am the amplitude of the M2 component is um, near zero, and the amplitude or the S2 component is really dominant in that frequency uh, spectrum or the amplitude spectrum. So when this is the case, this is uh, a, a good, it's typically um, understood to represent unconfined conditions. So these are kind of the two M members, and this is a simplified um, analysis based on earth tides um, so that we can extract uh, or identify confinement conditions. So this is the second part of the presentation, and this is looking at, uh, on the top left here, the exact same uh, groundwater pressure time series. 
um, but we're going to uh, use a completely independent um, means of analysis. And um, as Todd sort of spoke about, uh, we're going to compare the groundwater time series to a, a time series of barometric pressure in the atmosphere at the same location. And so that's shown on the top right here so in gold. So uh, same measurement duration, same sampling interval, say hourly sampling. And so now we're looking at whether um, the groundwater is responding to fluctuations in the um, atmosphere or bar barometric pressure. And these fluctuations are in the order, are much, much larger than Earth tide. So we're in the order of millimetres to centimetres in size. And so now, uh, unlike the Earth tide example, if we think of the subsurface as a sponge, again, this time, if we imagine that this, the, the, the geometry of the sponge is, is static in time, and it's not changing. So those pore, uh, the, the pore sizes in the, in the subsurface are not changing. But if we imagine that the load that's being imposed on that sponge is changing through time. And so that's, that's essentially what we're seeing, potentially seeing in the groundwater uh, time series. And so, uh, and so that load, as I'm trying to show on the schematic figure here, that load and that variation in the load is essentially being um, applied at the, the water table. So it's loading on the, um, saturated zone, but in more generally, it's it's a variation in the total load on the saturated zone. So, uh, in terms of responses and how does how does the subsurface respond to that change in load? Uh, in a confined aquifer, it'll be directly proportional. So, a meter change in barometric pressure will be a meter change in um, pressure in the confined aquifer. Uh, in an unconfined aquifer, there's no uh, uh, measurable response, and then in between, you have leaky aquifers where the response is, um, uh, it, it, there is a response, but it is a diminished response. And, and in an open borehole, there's no response, which is driving the, the, the flow in and out of the well, and consequently the level in the well. So the, the traditional approach to uh, interpreting these kind of responses, so groundwater responding to barometric pressure changes, one traditional method is um, linear regression. So, if we take both of these time series and then take the temporal derivatives of both time series, so then we're looking at, which are not shown here, um, it is kind of an intermediate step. So if we, if we do that, then we're looking at the change in groundwater at each point in time and the change in barometric pressure at each point in time. So that gives us two data sets that, are, that both have zero mean and both have comparable variation. And then we can plot the, uh, the, the change in groundwater versus time against the change in barometric pressure versus time. So that's the plot here in the center of the um, slide. And so uh, all of those points um, create a, a scatter cloud, um, the black points here. And so uh, as, as Todd mentioned, the relationships are inverse. So uh, that, that, and that's, that's what we're seeing here, inversely related. And what we can do then is uh, plot a, a, a line of best fit using linear regression. And the slope of that line is what we, what we call barometric efficiency. And so that provides a scalar quantitative measure of uh, the, the magnitude of groundwater response to the barometric pressure variation. And so in this case, it's 0.98. Uh, and so in, in a Python sense, um, that's, a, that's a one line calculation using lin regress command from the SciPy library. And similarly with our hydrogeoscience package, uh, that's, that's also a one liner. But in terms of interpreting these responses, uh, so a barometric efficiency value of around one would indicate confined conditions. So that's what we're kind of looking at here. Uh, whereas a barometric efficiency value of around zero indicates a lack of response. So unconfined conditions and values ranging from zero to one indicate some degree of, of, of leakage. Uh, and so um, just one last slide to finish up on here uh, before I'll give, give a quick recap. And just want to show that uh, as, as, as useful as it is, as it is to, uh, to quantify barometric efficiency and, and, and estimate confinement from groundwater responses to uh, barometric pressure variations, you can take it a step further and you can uh, derive a, a quantitative, um, a additional quantitative benefit from it. So folks, groundwater folks are probably familiar with the, the first statement here, so where specific storage is defined as a, a, a function of water density, gravity, compressibilities, and porosity. But um, people may be not as familiar with the second definition here, where specific storage can be defined alternatively using that, that barometric efficiency number that we just calculated. So um, with, with three knowns and uh, two, uh, barometric efficiency and one additional unknown, so aquifer effective porosity, we can get to a, 
uh, an estimate of specific storage uh, for an aquif a confined aquifer uh, without performing any sort of pump testing or something like that. So I'll just finish up here with the recap. So I've just sort of covered um, this is very um, high level sort of um, quick uh, broad brush uh, pass at these methods and explain some of these concepts. But um, yeah, just showing that, you know, uh, the, the influence of earth tides on groundwater pressure time series can be identified from uh, Fourier analysis. And the, the, the main takeaway there is the confinement status of an aquifer. And then a, a completely independent uh, means of um, interpreting the same input data set uh, is looking at the response to atmospheric um, var variations in atmospheric, atmospheric pressure. And so one example of uh, a method being used there being linear regression. Uh, and then the two real key um, take home um, uh, benefits there are again, an independent estimate of confinement status, but also uh, an estimate of confined aquifer specific storage. So I'll leave that there and I'll hand back to Cray and uh, Gab and yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, as Gab is getting ready to share his screen, let's just um, remind everybody, um, if you have put a technical question for the panelists into the chat line, um, if you can please copy that into the Q&A line, that'll allow us to track it better. I see a few questions. Thanks to the presenters who have been answering these in the background. Uh, but yes, let's keep those coming and we'll get to that discussion shortly after Gab's presentation. So over to you, Gab, we can see your screen just fine. Thanks, Craig. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm calling in from Germany, where it is about uh, um, 35 past seven. Um, thanks, Todd, and thanks, Chris, for introducing this topic. Um, I would like to refer to all these methods as um, with an overarching theme as passive subsurface characterization, which I think um, fits this topic very well. So what we look uh, for here is we look for, for the noise in the data set of groundwater monitoring and we're, we're trying to make use of that noise rather than to cancel out, out that noise. Hence the term um, passive subsurface characterization because it comes from monitoring data. So the aims of my presentation will follow on from Todd's and Chris's. Um, I'll be giving an overview of the groundwater response to tidal forces. Um, and we'll be looking at how to interpret the groundwater response to earth and atm atmospheric tides in particular. I'll be explaining those terms. And then as a last item, um, we'll be trying to quantify subsurface properties using the groundwater response to earth and atmospheric tides. Um, I won't go into too much detail in terms of mathematics here but um, I'll give an overview of um, what this all means because it's uh, probably fairly new to many practitioners. Let's first have a look at um, uh, monitoring. And I think Todd did a really good job in um, explaining to you how important monitoring is and what aspects we have to consider. Don't be confused too much by all these technical terms on this figure, just focus on the rough overview. What I want to show here is that there is roughly two types of groundwater monitoring infrastructure, and they have two, uh, two different implications. On the left side, you see a standard groundwater monitoring well, which is basically a hole that has been drilled into the ground. It has been, for example, um, um, a pipe. So there's a pipe down there, there's a screen down there, and water can enter and can equilibrate um, inside the pipe to the same level as in the aquifer. On the right side, you see what many refer to as the vibrating wire piezometer. And it's basically um, a pressure transducer that has been grouted at the bottom of a hole. And then the hole has been filled again, um, basically with um, a lot of concrete or grout. Um, and so these two, and this is really important, they provide two different responses that we have to consider. And I have to refer um, also to what uh, Chris said before about the slope being negative. It depends on which of these groundwater monitoring infrastructures you are using. So let's have a look at this. At the top, you see um, basically what happens when you have a vibrating wire piezometer and the response to atmospheric pressure. So here, um, the gray line um, depicts um, a biometric pressure signal that was monitored at the surface. And the blue line um, represents a pressure signal that was picked up by, let's say, a vibrating wire piezometer. In reality, what we did here is we uh, used a borehole that was shut off to the atmosphere with a borehole packer. And that basically um, results in the same response as when we have what we call a um, groundwater monitoring um, infrastructure that is close to the atmosphere. At the bottom, you see a well water level. So this was, uh, this was monitored in a, in a um, well that is open to the atmosphere. And then what I want you to take away here is the two different responses that you see to the, to the biometric pressure. 
At the top, you'll see that your uh, pore pressure responds in phase with changes of the atmospheric pressure, whereas at the bottom, your, um, your well responds out of phase, meaning that as soon as the barometric pressure goes down, the well water level goes up. So there's, there's a simple message here, and that is if you have a well water, a, a well um, to monitor groundwater levels, the simple fact that you have established a well will, will already influence uh, your monitoring signal. It will already cause an inverse in that, um, in that well water level in response to the barometric pressure. And that is a cause of um, the subsurface being elastic, where the subsurface uh, matrix takes on some of the load that comes from the barometric pressure. We'll be getting into this a little bit more when I uh, do the live course. Um, the next term I want to introduce is atmospheric tides. Um, and apologies for the spellow up here, which would be atmospheric tides. I call them AT in groundwater. And what I want to show here is basically at the top, you see a 12 year barometric pressure record that was uh, recorded in Australia at a field site um, at high resolution every 15 minutes. And at the bottom, I did some magic. Um, I applied what we call wavelet synchro squeeze transform. I don't expect you to know what that is, but what it does is it unravels the frequency um, in quite some detail, which is the vertical axis over time in the horizontal axis. And what you see here is you see a color splash or more a gray splash of the intensity of the frequency that occurs in this. And what I've cut off here is I've cut off all the frequencies that are outside of um, what we call the 0 0.5 and a three cycle per day frequency. So CPD stands for cycle per day. So it's a similar unit to Hertz. Um, it's a harmonic uh, frequency unit, but it is a much slower unit. So it refers to cycles per day. And what you see here is that we have a one cycle per day energy content in that barometric pressure signal, but that waxes and wanes in energy over the seasons. And we have a two cycle per day um, a content in that um, time series. Um, and this one stays constant over time. And we can actually use this um, to quantify subsurface properties, or we can use the groundwater response uh, to this particular uh, type of frequency. Now, the second one um, I want to show is um, earth tides um, and how the, earth uh, how the groundwater responds to earth tides. Um, I think Chris touched upon this a little bit. I'll show left top. We see in red um, a gravity measurement at member station um, here in the Rhine Valley. Um, and this is an actual measurement of the change in gravity. And as Chris pointed out, um, average gravity is 9.81. Um, we see here that there's a fluctuation and, and um, it has a harmonic content. And that is uh, what we call uh, referred to as earth tides. On the right side, we see a strain measurement in a subsurface. So this is a direct response to the earth tides that are, um, that are acting um, on the subsurface, a so-called eigenstrain. And at the bottom, you see how a well water level could respond to earth tides. So this is one of my prominent examples that shows a very high in the well water level. And you see here that we have between five and 10 centimeters of well water level. I put it here to show you that it can happen. I want to point out here is that when you want to use earth tides to do analysis, um, we have come up with a nice uh, package called PyG Tide, um, which you can find on GitHub and download. And this um, also is included in our hydrogen science package, which I'll um, quickly introduce later. Now let's um, move on. Basically, um, those two influences, atmospheric pressure and earth tides, are uh, a force that you can see reflected in the groundwater level. So you see here on the right a graph um, from uh, as early as 1939 by Mainzer. And what you can see here is that as the earth tides act with a smaller amplitude and as the atmospheric pressure acts with a sort of irregular energy content and a smaller amplitude harmonic content, you see both of these very clearly reflected in the groundwater level. Now, this is what we want to use. Um, we want to use this groundwater response because we know both drivers, we can then basically estimate and or quantify subsurface uh, properties uh, from that groundwater level response using, for example, regression analysis or harmonic analysis or the fast Fourier transform, as was mentioned before. Now, I would need you to keep in mind that these two mechanisms um, have uh, uh, two different uh, mechanics behind them. And you see here on the left side in this graph, um, earth tides depicted. And the take home message here for you is that basically earth tides act directionally. 
So as the moon circulates around the earth and as both of them um, basically wobble around the sun, um, you have a strain in the subsurface that is introduced and it has a directional force. And that forces the well water level in, um, forces the um, uh, subsurface um, to contract like a sponge and it basically um, uh, results in a well water level rising and falling as you can see here. Whereas on the right side, you see the atmospheric pressure and atmospheric tides and they act as a vertical load on the subsurface. And similar to um, with earth tides, um, it also acts on the subsurface like a sponge and it pushes water in and out of the well, which also results in um, a well water level change. Now these two um, we can use as a so-called spectral fingerprint um, to screen the subsurface. So if you see here on the left, if you take a snapshot through the subsurface all the way from the atmosphere through the unconfined zone into the confined zone and then further down into bedrock, um, when you do a frequency analysis um, of your well water levels and your earth tides and your barometric pressure, you basically can find some characteristic signatures um, in the frequency components, which will tell you something about the subsurface. It will tell you, for example, if your subsurface is unconfined, if it's confined, um, or if it consists of um, consolidated or unconsolidated sediments. So this is a fairly useful approach. Now for this, and this is what I wanted to point out, really important, all you need um, are well water levels, which are measured, barometric pressure, which are measured, um, and earth tides, which are calculated using that software I showed you before. Now, there's a lot of um, potential for this, and there's also um, a nice summary in a publication um, of ours, and I will post a link to this publication later in the chat. Um, bear in mind, this link is an open link because, unfortunately, this publication is behind a paywall, but I'll make this available for you. Now, you see here is a, a time series, a very long time series of um, earth tides in red, um, of barometric pressure in gray, and of groundwater levels down in blue. And I, I want you to see that these are the three sort of ingredients that we need in order to do passive subsurface characterization or look, uh, calculate subsurface properties. For example, we can do a spectral analysis. And as you've seen before, um, in the different frequency bands, you will see different components here depicted as O1 or P1 or K1. Um, and we will, in the course, we'll get into the details of what they are. So these are frequency components um, um, that come from earth tides and atmospheric tides. Now, as a last slide, I wanted um, to show you that we have a Python package, which does um, a lot of this analysis in a semi-automated way. It also does uh, data pre-processing. Um, and you can see up the top here, um, this Python package uses as an input a time series, for example, from a C, uh, comma separated value or Excel spreadsheet um, of barometric pressure or pressure head. Um, it can then um, basically calculate for that particular geolocation, the earth tides um, for that particular time. And then at the bottom, you can see that this package does um, quite a lot of um, fancy stuff. So um, it starts with, for example, um, regress, simple linear regression, as Chris has shown before. It also does harmonic analysis, the fast Fourier transform. It can plot you an amplitude and a phase spectrum of your um, frequency content of your well water levels and your barometric pressure. And it calculates um, what Chris has referred to as the barometric response function to let you assess whether a, a subsurface is confined or unconfined. Now, bear in mind that this Python package is developed open source and open access, um, and it is very much work in progress. Um, we appreciate um, if you test it, and we also appreciate if you're a little bit more into Python, if you help us develop uh, more functionality into it. The idea is that it becomes a comprehensive community-based tool that can deal with um, uh, passive subsurface characterization. So the goal for this would be um, an easy analysis and interpretation um, of rather sophisticated met methods um, applied to uh, groundwater time series in general. So with this, I thank uh, you very much for your attention and I invite you um, to post questions. And I will also um, post links to some of the publications that I've mentioned in this presentation in the chat. Thank you. All right, well, we appreciate that, Gab. Um, to give you a chance to have a look at the Q&A questions, we're gonna cycle back through, bring on our other presenters, Chris and Todd, and um, allow them to answer a couple of questions um, or state for uh, on the live feed, a couple of questions that may have been answered already. Now, if you do need to run and you want more of this, 
there is a course coming up, so do get back onto the Australian Water Schools uh, website. We'll highlight some of those slides at the end um, with the links. You'll get those links as well in your emails um, if you subscribe. Uh, but if you want to see more of this and uh, dive into the guts of it and do it yourself, um, I do recommend this course where each of these 10 to 15 minute segments will be turned into a full session, uh, allowing you to participate interactively with the presenters and get all the way through the exercises so you can get hands on experience. So with that, let's go back through in our order and turn it over to Todd for a selected question or two um, that you have taken from the Q&A line. Yeah, I mean, many of these questions, I get called from consulting companies and environmental uh, organizations as well as governmental organizations. So there's a lot of interest in these topics. Uh, there's the one on the ocean that I'd like to address. I mean, the effects of tidal signals are rather interesting. Um, even if you're far from the ocean, you get tidal effects. It's not so much ocean tides. The atmosphere itself is a fluid. It's not a liquid, but it is a fluid. And so you get what are called atmospheric tides. And these go up and down with the solar and lunar cycles. And so you also get what are called earth tides, which the earth itself deforms uh, physically. Uh, we put pressure uh, extensiometers, uh, displacement transducers on fractures and see them open and close uh, tidally as the earth is, um, it's a virtually, um, it's looked very much like ocean tides. So um, away from the ocean, you get these earth tides, the effects of atmospheric tides. Now near the ocean, you get two more effects. One would be the vertical loading effect. It'd be like a train rolling across a confined aquifer, like stepping on a balloon. When you step on the balloon, it compresses the fluid in the balloon. You're not actually adding water to the balloon. You're just increasing the pressure within it. And so as the ocean rises, it compresses the fluids in the underlying confined aquifers that propagates inland. Another technique is where it's actually mass flow rather than mass load. It's mass flow through the aquifer where you're actually recharging and discharging coastal aquifers, which is a completely different response curve. So disentangling these multiple different kinds of responses is our challenge. Excellent. No, I think that's that's a great comment. Um, and those comparisons when people talk, you know, even CFD modeling for the uh, water, you know, people who do water sometimes don't imagine that that F, that fluid includes air as well. So gases and liquids are both fluids uh, by definition. So thanks for that. Um, let's turn it over then to uh, Chris. Um, same just go through uh, you know, a selected, we won't be able to get to all of these uh, live, but um, the ones that you think were most upvoted or most uh, relevant to the presentation today. Yeah, some good questions about how these methods relate to uh, conventional methods. So uh, for example, pump testing um, and whether they're, uh, the, uh, the parameters that are estimated through these methods are comparable. Um, and also um, the, the, the data requirements for these methods, so or, or the, the duration of monitoring required for some, the, the methods that we're talking about. Whereas uh, a pump test is pump tests are undertaken it over uh, uh, in the order of hours to days, whereas the monitoring we're talking about is in the order of months. Um, but the, the, the key thing here is it's it's not it's essentially it's not active monitoring. We're kind of generally taking advantage of data sets that often already exist. Say for example from state government monitoring networks. So um, it's quite monitoring groundwater levels at hourly resolution is fairly common these days, if it happens to be in your area of interest, that is. Um, so often we're taking advantage of legacy data sets and extracting additional information from them. One particular question I did like was uh, whether uh, someone picked up on uh, the, the traditional methods I was talking about in terms of res groundwater response to barometric pressure um, this person picked up that they, they are assuming instantaneous response, and that was one of the tr uh, traditionally one of the limitations of those, those methods that had, had been around for a number of years. Um, and so I just have to give Todd a shout out here. So Todd was one of the first people to actually de uh, derive a new method back in the late 90s, 
um, where you could actually look at um, whether there is a time lag between the groundwater response and the barometric pressure change. And so that's that's something I unfortunately didn't have time to fit into my presentation today, but it is something we'll definitely include in the course. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really valuable method for making that assessment. Excellent. Oh, thanks for that. Um, over to you, Gab. Uh, anything you've seen that you wanted to highlight for the group? Yes. Um, very interesting questions, and they're all uh, spot on. Um, so I think to the question of how does pumping affect um, our analysis? Well, pumping, um, the magnitude of the response to pumping is quite big. And um, so what we look for is we're, we're looking for the signals in the noise. Um, and so when you have a pumping signal, you will have to remove this in order to find a signal in the noise, um, just because of the difference in the magnitude of both signals. Um, and that's a very important um, thing to say. Um, I've also seen the, a very great question um, on how representative are uh, aquifer properties um, in, um, in comparison with traditional methods, for example, pumping tests. Now, this is a really great question, um, in particular because there's very, very little research on this right now. Um, there's a large gap and there's a lot of work to be done. Um, now, research has indicated that we are ending up in a sort of right order of magnitudes, but research also shows that um, it depends on a lot of different factors because you're sampling different aquifer volumes, for example, that's one big aspect. Um, and a second big aspect of this um, is that um, subsurface properties are frequency dependent. So when you do a pumping test, for example, you have a different, you, you probe a different frequency of the aquifer compared to when you're doing um, an, uh, and analysis using tights. Um, however, um, this will have to be, an, a better answer to this question will have to be postponed, let's say for another five years until we have more research available on this, uh, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Todd, you wanted to follow up on that one? Yeah, just two points. In terms of matching the, the aquifer properties with field tests, uh, let me share my screen. We did a um, periodic test where we pumped an aquifer sinusoidally. Rather than pumping at a constant rate, we could not do that at the Savannah River site because this was contaminated with plutonium and nuclear waste and chemical waste so that we could not discharge the water. So we simply pumped, uh, it was an oscillating test. We just raised and lowered the water level periodically. And uh, we estimated the aquifer parameters, T and S, that were consistent with conventional pumping tests. Uh, they had to containerize all their waste. It was million dollars, over a million dollars for each aquifer test compared to ours that cost virtually nothing. And the only difference was in the unconfined aquifer where our frequency was so fast it behaved more like a confined rather than uh, delayed uh, drainage from the unsaturated zone. So there's a lot of interest now in trying to um, understand that. The other one is how do the material properties change as you draw down the aquifer? There's two answers to that. One is we see compaction and subsidence. In many parts of the world, there's over pumping and you see the actual matrix of the aquifers uh, compact and subside. And so we see a loss of storage. And we're trying to use these estimates of storativity to estimate the potential subsidence effect in coastal aquifers. The other is seismic events. There's work in Japan and China, as well as the US, looking at um, uh, seismic um, behavior, not just after the seismic event, where we see changes in the hydraulic uh, properties, but even leading up to a seismic event, the, the changing stress field changes poor fluid property, uh, pressures that change the hydraulic properties that may allow us to better predict uh, when large earthquakes might occur. Ah, yeah, excellent. Um, I, you know, looking at uh, the amount of background material we've got here, um, I guess I did want to highlight one thing that we can uh, offer going forward. Um, for surface water people, we are uh, doing a first principles course, uh, basics, the essentials um, coming up. And this is one of the things I wanted to highlight based on uh, what, uh, what Todd has just shared. Um, you know, when we talk about fluids and waves and oscillations and things like that, if you don't think air is a fluid, have a look at these cloud formations here. I mean, you know, 
this is uh, you know this is physics. Uh, these principles um, you know do apply. And what we're doing for surface water over the next couple of months, we're going to try and take you know everything that that some of the experts out there think that you would need to know on the first principles to start running surface water models. We're going to try and get you in a concise course, and we're going to plan on doing the same thing for groundwater as well. So people come on and take mod flow courses through this um, the Australian Water School. You know what do the instructors wish the uh, attendees knew about the first principles and the essentials. We'll try and get that in one concise uh, um, set of lectures and interactive workshops, um, in addition to the ones that you'll see these presenters um, teaching uh, over the next couple of months. So if you want to be notified of that, do subscribe. Subscribe on our YouTube channel for the Australian Water School and uh, to the Water School directly so that you'll get these notifications. So with that, we've got just a couple minutes to go. So what I'll do is just put up, um, have each of you just do your closing remarks um, um, for the day today, and then we'll put up some slides on some additional resources. So again, we'll just go back through in the same order as before, starting with uh, Todd. Um, any closing remarks from you? You know, just as uh, Gab said, that this is a collaborative effort. So, you know, the software, we would like to get all the professional community involved in this to um, use these tools, help us improve the tools, uh, use your data sets to refine and identify uh, areas that we need to support further in our efforts. So we look to you as the general practitioners to help us uh, implement this system. Thanks. Excellent. Uh, Chris, closing remarks from you. Yeah, thanks, Craig. Yeah, probably uh, for me, it's um, the difficulty of distilling some of this information into a 10 uh, minute time slot. Uh, so I'm, I'm, what I'm, I'm really looking forward to the course where we can take a bit more time uh, with the attendees and go through some of the physics, you know, discuss some of those physics with a bit more nuance, you know, and, and also same with the methods. So we can, you know, really dig into some of the more advanced methods and, and you know, um, that'll, be a, that'll be a lot of fun. Excellent. Uh, yeah, you can see the registration links there. Um, do get on there and have a look at the content and you can sign up right now. Um, if uh, we can turn over to Gab uh, for your closing remarks. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, what I want to say here is that um, I think a lot of what we presented here might be quite novel to some groundwater practitioners because it's not actually taught in university courses, I would say yet. Um, and so it's a bit of a niche topic, but um, with our Australian Water School outreach that we're doing right now and with the live course and the webinar, we wish to basically fulfill our function as academics and bring this into the into the world um, for practitioners to use. And I think um, it is a very important um, um, function that we have here in, in teaching this to um, practitioners around the world, because I think it's very beneficial and useful and very low cost. Excellent. Um, we are right on the hour. Thanks so much to the presenters, to each of you. Um, and just to let the attendees know, um, the presenters that come to you on these webinars do so as volunteers. Um, this is, uh, we, you know, no, nobody's compensated for coming on and providing these webinars to you. All 120 that you see uh, on our website, um, these have all been volunteer, you know, expert presenters volunteering their time to get the information out there um, in the interest of, you know, uh, improving the science, improving the topics. I'm looking for as a surface water modeler um, to the grand unified model someday where we can put groundwater and surface water and let it all run together at the same time. I know there's some models that claim to be able to do that, but uh, uh, the practicality of that is still maybe a few years off, um, like some of the statistics that, uh, that Gab mentioned. So with that, thank you so much. Um, have a look at these slides. Do fill out the one minute survey at the end to guide future events. Uh, lots of links here, um, whether you want to model uh, mod flow or two flow or HECRAS or any of these things. Um, have a look at all the resources that are available to you and let's make this water industry, uh, continue to improve this water industry with uh, the communication and the collaboration and the uh, presentation of uh, innovative new things that help this science. So thanks all for your um, enthusiasm uh, to the presenters and for your time. We'll see you next time around with the Australian Water School. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Subscribe by clicking the link below and click on the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases. For the latest in significant, innovative and critical advances in water science, technology and management, subscribe now to build your skills, enhance your technical knowledge and learn from leading experts in water, visit the australianwaterschool.com.au and discover our online training courses.
both live and on demand.